I'm not 100% sure that everyone here knows me, so I'll do a little bit of an introduction to myself uh, in my presentation, because some of you might have, you might know of me, but you don't really know much about me. But it's just a joy to be with you today. I hope you are safe and uh, you're recovering or you are preventing <laughs> because we're in a People say it's the, the second wave, but I would say it's more like a tsunami that has hit Uganda of COVID. And uh, yeah, it's not an easy time, but we just thank uh, God for our lives. And we thank you. We thank uh, God for this, uh, this family of friends that all of you have uh, tapped into. And uh, yeah, with those few words, let me just go straight into my presentation. Um, I'm going to do a, a screen share, and uh, it's a PowerPoint, and at the end of the presentation, I'll, um, I'll give my contact. So if you would like it, um, just to review yourself, but also to teach, because, you know, we, we look at you guys as leaders, and many of you are leading small groups, so at times you need material to teach, and you can get uh, some of these presentations that I give and pass them on to others. <clears throat> so the topic we are looking at uh, this afternoon is emotional intelligence. And uh, a book came out some years ago with that title, written by this guy, Daniel Goldman. Uh, the book is not easy to read, um, but just the title alone captured people's attention like nothing else. And it became a, a bestseller because people saw that there was something behind it. Um, the guy himself, uh, later on, he came out with a book called uh, Social Intelligence. And he nowadays, he talks about emotional and social intelligence because uh, he realized the first book didn't explain things very well. But those of us who are attracted to uh, leadership, we're, we are basically in the people business. We're not dealing with machines. We're not dealing with uh, so much with uh, agriculture or you know, things that are, I mean, we can be, but our, our, our orientation is more around human beings and, and leading. And all of us, regardless of uh, our occupations or our interests have to deal with relationships. I think some of the biggest uh, challenges of my life and some of the biggest challenges that you will face have to do with managing relationships. I think this is one of the most uh, challenging parts. I'm not just talking about relationships as you understand it as young people, uh, but relationships all throughout your life, uh, the interactions you have with friends and family and coworkers and, and people that you are trying to partner with in different ventures. But I just want to begin by thanking each of you that uh, you know serve mostly on, on a voluntary basis just to keep AYLF moving at your respective campuses. I know it's not easy sometimes to gather people and uh, especially under the difficult circumstances that we are in um, and make you know a contribution towards uh, a better Uganda and a better world. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, I also want you to understand that uh, your time at campus is not just about education. Uh, yes, you are at campus to get a degree, but uh, you should be thinking of this time uh, at least in four other capacities besides education. So if you're taking notes, uh, they all begin with the letter E. They're, they're all extremely important. Uh, because all of us have seen uh, guys who have uh, finished university with first class degrees and now they are walking the streets. Uh, they are still jobless because they neglected some of these other aspects. So when you're at campus, uh, four things you should be thinking about. Um, the first one obviously is education. You have to complete, you have to get your piece of paper, you have to uh, have something to show for all these years you have struggled uh, to read and study and do exams. But secondly, aspect of exposure, uh, try to you know, join seminars, do side workshops, uh, participate in uh, 
conferences, anything that can give you a broader uh, scope of understanding of life beyond just the material that you are focusing on in your course. So exposure just means you're opening your mind, you're broadening your horizons. Number three, if you can at all get some ex experience by volunteering, even if you volunteer with AYLF, you can list that as, a, as an experience on your CV, but try to uh, get some experience, especially in the field of your study, because as soon as you finish uh, campus, the first thing people ask you is what experience has a lot of relevance to AYLF. Uh, expand your network. Um, most people don't realize when they're young that uh, there's a lot of truth to this saying that says your network becomes your net worth. So the connections that you have are extremely important. Your network becomes your net worth. And uh, about 70% percent of jobs are coming through your network right now and that includes your university professors lecturers I always challenge you guys make sure the university lecturer knows your name I know some of you are in classes of a hundred but they should know you you should stand out you should go and introduce yourself to them you should ask them questions a few times until they they get to know you because they're part of your network but most especially uh, the people that surround you like the people on this call, I want you to really see that AYLF is really part of your lifelong network of like-minded, upwardly mobile friends within Uganda of your generation that you're building up for your future. It's a network that you can choose to build up and, and be connected to for the rest of your life. For us, we see it in that way. It's, so it's really your future. And it's you to make it something dynamic, relevant, and transformational to Uganda. So yeah, we're all uh, part of this network. And uh, this afternoon, just before I got on this call, I, I, I was walking around my neighborhood. I live in Kololo. And I stepped out of my gate. I walked down the street. And within a few minutes, a vehicle pulls up alongside of me. A nice car. I not, didn't recognize the car, but uh, the guy, the driver rolled down the window and uh, I suddenly saw this was a familiar face. And this was an AYLF member who had been part of our uh, community about six or seven years ago. I think his name is Osa, some of you might know him, uh, but he graduated from university and his wife was in a car with him. And they had a little baby and they were going over to uh, Kampala Hospital, which is near where I live. But you see, you can see the power of a network where, you know, you just, like everywhere I go now, I meet young people like that. And um, you too, if you, if you invest in your relationships, a lot of doors, connections will open for you. But most young people are taking uh, relationships, friendships, networks accidentally and not cultivating it intentionally, not sticking with people. So over time, there's a dilution effect and you can find yourself isolated and alone. But so yeah, I'm just making a point about seeing AYLF as your network, something that's going to be part of the rest of your life from Paka last, if you want it to be. If you're visionary, if you're strategic, you will make it so. And uh, you know, we see that you guys, and uh, AYLF, uh, at your age, you're, you're mostly interested in two things. You want to get established in the practical things of life, complete your education, get a job, get married, have a family, career, so forth. But besides that, most of you also want to add value to the world, to make a difference, to make a positive contribution toward your country and, and the world. Mandela said, success is what we do for ourselves. That's the first bit. But then he said, significance is what we do for others. And I think of those of us with a spiritual orientation, at the end of our lives, we want to have something to show that we have done something with this life God has given us. But both of these things will be enhanced 
if you try to uh, move through life with others and not just walk alone and be isolated. So look at your small group, look at the connections in Ayurveda as a lifelong network and you'll go farther. Yeah, so also realize that at the university level, AYLF is just like an entry point to a, a long-term matrix of significant relationships. So after university, we invite you guys to stay connected in a small group with our alumni, Nathan and others run that so that you can keep st sticking together, supporting each other and inspiring one another as you move through the different stages of life. So yeah, see it as, as this network, see it as this family of friends. It's very rare, I would say, uh, among your peers in this generation. You can talk to them. You'll, find, you'll probably find that almost none of them have something like we have in this family of friends in this network. So a little bit about myself now. Um, I'm actually a dual citizen, Uganda uh, and US. And I grew up in uh, this region. I grew up in Congo and Rwanda, Uganda, Burundi. Went to high school a bit in Kenya. I've lived uh, over 40 years in East Africa. I'm married uh, with two kids. They're grown, they have children of their own. So I'm a grandfather, a jaja. I'm also a co-founder and director of Cornerstone Development. And out of Cornerstone grew AYLF, but we spun it off as its own entity to a certain degree so that people wouldn't look at it as an NGO, but they would look at it as a movement. But it's still very much a part of, uh, yeah, our, our thinking, our efforts, our, our people, our connections, it's all there to support this movement of AYLF. So I'm just gonna keep uh, moving forward. This is my family. Um, my wife and I are locked down in Kampala, uh, but my son uh, on the right-hand side with a red sweater and his uh, wife, Danny, they, they live here in Uganda, but they've gone back to the US with their two little boys who are my buddies. And we have a daughter who's also in the red sweater uh, who lives in the States and she's married and she has a little boy. And so far, all of them have been uh, safe from this pandemic that has been, uh, causing havoc all over the world. So when the boys are home, I do a little bit of homeschooling with them and it's been a joy to be in this stage of life. But my parents uh, in the 1950s, before I was born, when it was still Belgium, Congo, they went to Congo and uh, they're in Africa for about five years and they went back to the States for a year and I was born during that time. They kept going back and forth. We would be five years in Africa, one year in the US. In this picture, I'm the little guy on the left, Timmy. We had uh, five boys and no girls in the family. When I look at my photo album, I can see from my early years, uh, I not only grew up in Africa, but I grew up with Africans. You know, there are some Bazungu who grow up kind of isolated in their own circles and, and friend and uh, community. But I was often in a rural setting and uh, I had friends right from early ages who were uh, African kids. But I left Africa for university as all of the children in my family it was a tradition. When you finished high school, you went back to the States and you went to university and you never really had any plan to come back. And, and that was me. I went there and you know, us Africans, when they take us to the US, we don't want to come back. So I was there. But I, when I was in university, I started asking myself uh, some of these big questions of life that maybe some of you are asking at this stage. Things like, uh, what am I studying for? What is the purpose of life? What should I do with this life? And uh, it was like a time of questioning and soul searching. Um, and it kind of led to a spiritual reawakening that changed the course of my life. Um, basically, I was feeling like I should try and 
invest my life in things that have uh, value in a bigger scheme of things. I began to see one lifetime, you know, be it uh, 70 or 90 years here on earth as being very short compared to the incredibly vast and ancient uh, 14 billion year system we are, we are in on, on a small rock, the third rock from the planet, uh, third rock from the sun in a small solar system in an incredibly vast galaxy. And yet there are hundreds and millions of those galaxies. So I started to get this impression that uh, my life was something to invest and not just to spend haphazardly consuming, enjoying, but to use it uh, as, as like investing in, in, in a way that would give me a greater return in the future. And I could see from our scriptures that uh, there are some teachings of Jesus indicated that the way that we use our talents is the way that we will be rewarded in the next chapter of things. So during that time, I got this idea that I, I should go back to Africa and I, I decided I'd been in the States three years I decided to come back and uh, look around and I volunteered for a year and I was asking to God if this was really the direction I should move in at the end of the year I decided it was I went back to the States and then came back uh, met my wife at university and uh, you know later teamed up with some two American friends we started Cornerstone uh, Development Africa almost 30 years ago. And uh, AYLF grew out of that. We have about 200 staff in seven countries. Uh, we have leadership academies and AYLF is in all those countries. AYLF has uh, spread to about 100 university campuses and we can't keep up with it. The young people of Africa are really my greatest inspiration and mentoring uh, you guys. The next generation is my passion. So it's what I've been doing for the last 30 years, and hopefully I'll do it for another 30, inshallah, God willing. And I also uh, try to avail myself to be a mentor to you guys, so I'll give you my contacts uh, at the end of this. Well, here they are right now. Um, you can follow me mostly on Facebook is my social media platform of choice. Uh, but then uh, that's my email address. If you would like a copy of this, I'll send it to you. Just my name, Tim Kreuter at Gmail. Okay, so yeah, as I said, AYLF has spread around the region. Um, this, at this time of the year, we do mid-year reviews for all of our programs in East Africa, and we're doing it on, on Zoom. And the people in Rwanda were telling us that in Rwanda, 90% of the university student leaders at the top universities are part of AYLF. In Kenya, a similar kind of uh, situation where uh, the top university student leaders are joining AYLF. And in Uganda, it's also, uh, you know, it's something that we, we would like to see also get uh, to be clearly the, uh, the leading platform for, for young leaders in this region. Um, yeah, basically, we're looking to transform the leadership culture at the university level in East Africa, leaders who are more uh, having integrity, more principled, more unity-minded, and so forth. Okay, so just quickly, what is leadership? Uh, to me, I like this definition uh, of leadership. And uh, it says leadership is the capacity to influence others through Inspiration, motivated by a passion, generated by a vision, produced by a conviction, ignited by a purpose. So a lot of big words there, but uh, this quote by Miles Monroe kind of captures the basic um, terms that often are reflected in uh, leadership. But today we'll be talking about this idea of influencing others. Um, and like I say, you know, being in this space as leaders, emotional intelligence is important. Um, and in AYLF, uh, you probably have heard this many times. But we are looking for people who will take up leadership, not 
not run away from responsibility, but move toward leadership uh, responsibility. That's number one. People who have good character. Number three, people who can maintain relationships like I've been talking about. And people that can promote unity and reconciliation across all that is dividing humanity, be it religion, be it tribe, be it national boundaries. This, this is just ridiculous the way that human beings have failed to see each other as brothers and sisters because of race or tribe or religion. These are artificial constructs uh, that, God, that God did not create, but that we have created. And we think that Jesus uh, spoke to this when he said, whoever, anybody who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And he said, we should love our neighbors. We should love our, even our enemies. So it's like he was calling us to come back to a recognition that we are brothers and sisters, regardless of all the divisions. So yeah, we believe in you guys at AYLF, uh, and that's why we are investing. Okay, I wanna get into the talk, emotional intelligence. Um, all of us have come across this term called IQ. IQ stands for intelligence quotient. And it's trying to put a number that represents someone's reasoning ability. And it is measured by problem solving tests. So, you know, for a lot of times, everyone was just uh, a lot of time, uh, a lot of time, people are just looking at intelligence and whether they could pass an exam, whether they could reason, and whether they could be. Uh, recognized for having uh, problem solving ability. But then people realize that there are, some of the people in society have this in big quantities, but they're still failures in other areas of life. So people started to think that there must be something more to success and significance than just someone's uh, mental intelligence. So in AYLF, material, you, you might have come across this diagram. And in this diagram, it shows four basic areas of life. And in it, uh, we see that there is a mental area, that's IQ, but there's a spiritual area, and there's a social area, and there's a physical area. In the physical, we talk about the biology and the financial, that's uh, combined into both the physical area. And you can see that uh, these circles are meant to overlap and a well-balanced person who experiences well-being is someone who has learned to cultivate healthy habits in each of these four areas. So you could put it this way that there are four intelligences. There's the spiritual intelligence, intellectual quotient intelligence, there's emotional intelligence, and there's physical intelligence. Quotient just means a, a degree or a quantity or an amount of a particular thing. So this afternoon, we're talking more about emotional intelligence, which is largely uh, in the area of managing ourselves and managing relationships well. So another way to look at it is putting them in terms of a hierarchy. Um, and uh, showing them on a scale of uh, the broadest, lowest being the physical, then the next, the math, verbal intelligence, then emotional, social, and then the highest being spiritual. So this is another way to think of it. But as we look at the emotional intelligence or social, emotional, social intelligence, you can see, if you read that book by Daniel Goldman, there are four basic uh, parts to this. There's the aspect of being aware of your, yourself, your own emotions, your personality, your tendencies, your weaknesses. That's some people can't even see themselves that way, but that is self awareness. And then the second one is managing all that. So you can have this awareness of your feelings, your emotions, but how do you manage it? That's the second. Then the third part is learning to 
tune in to what other people's emotional states are and uh, looking at how they are doing and, and what's bothering them, what's disturb is disturbing them. That's number three. And then number four is learning to work with them, learning to manage them, the social skills that you have. So number three is like empathy, the ability to put yourself in into somebody else's shoes and, and imagine what they're going through. But then number four is how do you uh, relate to them well and how do you manage that relationship? And you know, here we have different personality types that come in and we have different genders and different ages. And, and so there's a complexity that's needed for you to be uh, good at emotional or social intelligence. So yeah, these four areas, I'll repeat them again, the capacity to recognize the impact that our feelings are having on ourselves, self-awareness. Secondly, the impact to manage our emotions and the resulting uh, actions that come from emotions. Thirdly, the capacity to read or tune into the feelings of others. And number four, the capacity to interact skillfully, we could say compassionately with the people around us. So that's really the heart of this uh, material of emotional and uh, social intelligence. The, I wanna talk a little bit about this one of self-awareness. Um, in the AYLF material, we also have this idea that there are four things that separate a human being from an animal. And the more you cultivate these four things, the less of an animal you are and the more of a refined human you become. So these four things that differentiate human beings from animals are number one, self-awareness. The capacity to like almost stand outside of yourself and to see yourself the way other people are looking at you. A human being can do that to some degree. An animal cannot do that at all. Then conscience. Conscience is like a, it's a internal compass of your morals and values that, that signals you when you are going off of your values. And then number three, freedom of choice. You have the ability to choose to a much higher degree than an animal. You have ability to choose your, your responses to various stimuli. An animal just acts on instinct. If it's stimulated in one direction, it'll just automatically give in to instinct. But a human being has a capacity to pause between stimulus and response and to choose a response that is in line with its values. And then number four, creative imagination. As a human being, you can imagine what you want your life to look like five, 10 years from now. You can start to build ideas in your, in your mind of the kind of uh, life that you would like to live. An animal cannot do that. So these things, the more you exercise them, the more of a refined human you are. So self-awareness is part of uh, emotional intelligence. But uh, if you want to go deep in this, you can see that there are core uh, competencies in each of these four domains that uh, can be worked on to, uh, to improve your social and emotional intelligence. On the very right-hand side in the lower corner, you can see that uh, in the blue circle, it says inspirational leadership. So you can see as a leader, uh, the more emotional and social intelligence you develop, uh, develop, the more your leadership will be improved. Okay, moving on now. Um, yeah. I would also put under self-awareness, spiritual self-awareness, meaning understanding who you are as a, hum as a spirit being who is here having a human experience because ultimately that's what our sacred texts uh, inform us, that we are actually spirit beings. We come to planet earth like someone would come to a boarding school, 
but we don't stay here forever. So that when you have this kind of awareness, it also influences your decisions and how you live your life. But on the area of emotional intelligence, um, there's a range of the capacities that people have to, to name what they are feeling. Uh, different personalities do this better than others. There are some men, they don't even know what they are feeling. They are just been taught all their life to shut down their feelings. And if you ask them, what are you feeling right now? They can't even tell you. But people working with children nowadays in uh, early childhood education, they are teaching them to look at a diagram like this and, and name what they are feeling so that they can start to tune in and develop self-awareness about their emotional states. Because if you can't feel your feelings, then you can't modify that. They, they have basically, uh, you know, they're, you are disconnected from them. Um, and, the, you know, there are times we get stuck in feelings. Uh, feelings are supposed to move through us. You're supposed to be able to feel it deeply, but not to let it get stuck in you for days, months, years on end. Some people that are struggling with depression, they have a mood or a spirit that they can't shake. So part of emotional intelligence is tuning in to these, asking them questions. Why am I feeling like this? What is behind this? And probing deeper and looking for uh, reasons or things that are causing that. There are some very sophisticated uh, versions of this uh, feeling wheel and you can see like this one has like, uh, you know, like 48 different emotions that human beings are capable of um, feeling and it categorizes them in different ways. But you can see how sophisticated and complex our emotions can be. So yeah, when you work with emotional intelligence, you try to always identify what you are feeling and then you look a little bit deeper and look for what is causing that so if you're writing things down write this one down it says uh, emotions are meant to be indicators not dictators so you are not supposed to be your emotion you're supposed to have emotions but they are not supposed to have you and control you and dominate you so yeah, you want to let them come, but you also want to learn how to let them go and move on. So emotions are meant to be indicators and not dictators. And from a spiritual point of view, um, for all of us, we're, we're fully responsible for our vibe, our emotional state. You can't just say, that's me, deal with it. Like in our scriptures, we are, we are taught repeatedly to be grateful, to be joyful. And we can see that the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, I mean, these are almost like emotions. And so we're supposed to cultivate the ability to stay in a high vibe state and not to get uh, controlled and overwhelmed and lost in lower vibe states. There's a lot of uh, techniques that you can use for this, uh, self-talk, positive thinking, a lot of it depends on what you are feeding your brain on. If you're, if, you're, if you're tuning in and looking at all the latest conspiracy theories about coronavirus and people are telling you you're going to die and like you're going to basically allow fear to get into your life to such an extent that it controls you. So you have an ability to, to modify that and to work with it. You're not supposed to just be a victim of it all. All right, and yeah. A lot of scripture speaks of this, like Jesus would say, in this world, you're going to have a lot of tough situations, but be of good cheer. Keep your vibe high. You see all these verses like rejoice always and take every uh, thought captive and whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, think about these things rather than just allowing your mind to be a dumping space for a lot of rubbish. If you allow that to happen, don't be surprised if a lot of negative emotions start to take up residence in you. 
Another thing you can look at is what, what is uh, being called triggers. A trigger is, uh, you know, when something small happens, but you bust out or something small happens and it, you suddenly, you know, you feel this emotional weight coming on you. It's like it's a reminder that there's still some trauma that's unresolved. So a trigger is, is like, a, it's like an overreaction to anything. It could be a memory, could be something somebody says, it could be something you see, and suddenly you are reminded uh, of uh, an unresolved trauma or a wound, and it, it provokes an emotional reaction that is far beyond what the immediate circumstances should dictate, but you just bust out. So the, a trigger, if you have it, uh, is a, therefore an indicator of an underlying wound or a hang up that we, we have. And you can work on this with a counselor or you can work on this with friends. The more light that you shine on it, the, the trigger comes out of the shadows and it's neutralized. But the, as long as it stays hidden in there and you haven't really looked at it, you haven't spoken to it, you haven't talked to it, it will keep uh, hidden in the shadows and keep disorganizing itself. But any kind of the light of awareness that you bring to it helps to, 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 to reduce it. Uh, sometimes with AYLF gatherings, when we used to have like three-day gatherings before Corona in Uganda or uh, Kenya, we would, we would split the, the gents and the ladies into separate groups. And you know, sometimes men don't want to open up, but one thing we could see over these gatherings. We've been doing this work for 12 years. So we have some experience that whenever you ask boys to talk about their fathers, oh my goodness, they, many of them start crying. They, they, they feel overwhelmed and it shows that there's a trigger that they have around fatherhood issues. And this is a fact of life in this part of the world. Many young people have not had good fathers, had not had loving fathers. And you have to work on this uh, to get it so that it doesn't continue to, um, to, to cause the kind of pain and suffering that it might be causing at the moment. There's many things you can do to help overcome that trigger. So the more you bring self-awareness to these triggers, and it can be jealousy, it can be anger, it can be self-pity, just stop and take a look at it. Say hello to it. Say hello, jealousy. Say, hello, anger. How are you doing? Why have you come? What are you showing me? You see, emotions are meant to be indicators. They're showing you there's something you have to work on. There's some kind of belief or attitude or thought that is behind it that needs resolved. Just like Jesus, before he would cast out a demon, he would ask the demon to name itself. You see, by naming it, it starts to lose its power. And the light of awareness starts to dissolve it. So as you tune into your emotions and as you say hello to them and talk to them, they, they start to talk to you. They tell you, you know, and then you start to overcome some of the traumas and some of the, the wounds that all of us pick up as we are growing up in this, in this tough world. So, yeah, the process of self-awareness for emotional intelligence, uh, it has three steps. Number one, monitoring your vibe, looking at yourself, looking at your reactions, your internal self-talk. Don't let negative self-talk to just go on in your head forever. It will disorganize you. Arrest it. Take captive every thought through self-awareness. Number two, catch yourself. It's like a, a taxi pulls up when you have a, a trigger or a strong emotion, a taxi pulls up called fear. Are you going to board that taxi? When are you going to get off? It might take you down the road for miles and you, you are just stuck. But when it pulls up and you can see it, sometimes you can just say, no, I don't want to board that one. I know where it's taking me, let it go. Or you can get off of it after it's gone a short distance rather than letting it take you for a ride. <clears throat> Number three, managing yourself. Yeah, just... Uh, making sure that what you are feeding into your heart and mind 
is healthy and bringing you more into alignment with your own highest and best values and intentions. Okay, so you can look at their books like uh, Win How to Win Friends and Influence People that talk about uh, this in a practical way, emotional and uh, social intelligence. Uh, that book, uh, it has six key points. I'll just run through them quickly. I don't want to take too much of your time, um, but make an effort to become genuinely interested in other people. Don't bore people. Talk to their interests, not just yours. Um, when you're dealing with people, smile. A smile says, I care about you. Uh, I value you. I'm happy to be in your presence. Number three, um, find ways to remember people's names. <laughs> a person's name to them is the sweetest and most important sound. At the beginning of this call, I heard uh, Davis calling for Maureen, I think it was, to pray. You know, it's like when you know someone's name, it's like they feel that you, you care enough about them. And many top leaders have... Uh, a notebook where they note down people's names so that they can, uh, when they're traveling around or something, they can, they can quickly uh, remember the people they are supposed to meet. I'm just gonna push on here. Uh, this is big, I can give it to you later. But uh, number four, be a good listener. I think this is in the seven habits that many of you are going to study or have studied. Seek first to understand and then to be understood. This is human psychology. Like if you're having a lot of emotional intelligence, you do these things. You don't just bust out, you, you, you allow the other person to speak. That shows maturity, that shows intelligence. Number five, when you're talking to someone, try to talk in terms of the things that they might be interested in. And that helps them to feel like you're connecting. Number six, make them feel important. Uh, people like to feel special. So give them a sincere compliment on something that you see that they do well. Okay, um, yeah, let me just push on here. Uh, I have a lot of material and I don't want to over uh, keep you. But yeah, this one I think is worth spending a little time on. Um, why should you do all this? Why can't you just go through life and say, this is who I am, deal with it? Well, if you're number one on this thing, if you're really committed to your own personal and spiritual growth, you will want to overcome your weaknesses. You'll want to become the best version of yourself. So if you have that motivation, you will work at developing emotional and social intelligence. Number two, if you're interested in leadership and you want to maximize your influence for good in the world, you will work on this material. Number three, if you're committed to transcending your own ego programming so that more of your soul essence shines through. That's kind of complicated, but um, basically what it's saying is that each of us, um, one of our jobs in life is to move beyond the ego. Abram Maslow, Maslow in his hierarchy of needs at the end of his life, he added an, another level that was self-transcendence. It's like, you, you move beyond just your petty ego, interest and success, uh, and you just um, allow this divine aspect, uh, the divine light that's within you to shine forth and to be a blessing to others. Number four, um, emotional intelligence and studying it helps you to love people better. It helps you to love those that you uh, live with, and those that you work around. Because the more you understand someone and you see what is making them maybe behave the way they're behaving, you develop compassion. Like if you see somebody who is, is really a, a pain to live with, I bet if you looked at that person when they were a kid, you could see how somebody mistreated them. Somebody hurt them when they were little and that's why they developed into this nasty personality. So there's a, there's a level of compassion that also comes in um, and love for others as you start to grow in emotional intelligence. Okay, uh, yeah, self-awareness. How do you get to know more about yourself? 
at the top of this pie chart, uh, there's information you can get just through your own self-reflection and uh, introspection. But on the, on the lower left side, there's something that these small groups that you're in can help you with. You know, when you're in a good small group, your buddies, your friends can show you aspects of yourself that you haven't really seen. You know, there's a part of all of us that we are blind to. There are blind spots we're having. And a good small group helps to, to show you that there are things that uh, maybe you're not seeing that you could uh, possibly need to work on. And then the, the, the lower right uh, triangle talks about spiritual intelligence. There's a way that you can inform your sense of self by studying things from a spiritual perspective. And you realize what is a human being and why are we here? So these are all things that basically build up your self-awareness. And the more self-awareness you have, the more you are becoming a human being and you're not a robot, you're not an animal. All right, um, now there's one other thing. I'm just gonna throw this out to you, but it's a tool that can really exponentially increase somebody's self-awareness and awareness of others. There's a tool out there. I've used this tool for 30 years. It's not easy to grasp it, but if you can get it, there's a lot of good that you can come out, uh, get from it. A lot of people don't like to do it because it's a bit painful. It, uh, it, it shows you who you are underneath. And it's painful because it's sometimes hard to look at ourselves very honestly. But there's a book uh, called The Enneagram that uh, is uh, personality types. There's really only two uh, personality types out there, uh, systems. There's Myers-Briggs and there's the Enneagram. The Enneagram has more like a spiritual component to it, where some of you might have already come across Myers-Briggs. So these are personality typologies. And if you're dealing with emotional intelligence, you need to really understand your personality, your type, its strengths, its weaknesses. And secondly, you need to understand the, the, the wiring system of people that are around you. Enneagram comes from a word, uh, Enea means nine, and then gram means uh, mask. So there are like nine masks. There are nine basic types uh, that this book, I can send a PDF uh, of this to you also if you send me an email. You can start to study it because this is uh, a tool to develop emotional intelligence by understanding your personality type and starting to study and understand the types of other people. Um, so it, as a tool, it enhances the, the top triangle and then the triangle on the left, your own personal intelligence and then your social intelligence. So it starts to show you, if you identify which type you are, uh, your wiring system and also the wiring system of people close to you. All right, I'm just going to push to the next type. Okay, so I mentioned two types, Myers-Briggs and Enneagram. These are tools. If you want to go deeper with emotional intelligence, you need to study personality types because no human being, two human beings are the same. There are categories of personalities that are similar, but you can't use a one size fits all when you're a leader or when you're putting together a team, you have to have the ability to combine different personality types together to get, the, uh, to get a really strong, effective team. So as a leader, these are some tools. But the Enneagram is the book that I'm most familiar with. And like I said, I'll send you a PDF of one of them so you can begin to study it. It offers you a better understanding of your type and the types maybe of significant people uh, in your life, your parents, your friends. It's just a tool. Okay, as I close, um, 
Yeah, I just want all of you to realize you are unique. There's something that has been deposited in you. You have a gift to share with the world. And you must try and harness your potentials to the maximum to fulfill your mission. And studying things like emotional intelligence helps you with that. I want to conclude with a story that helps illustrate this idea that each of us was born with a mission. Each of us has gifts uh, that are latent within us that need to be cultivated, irrigated, and nurtured to reach your full potential. So I just came across this story uh, a couple of weeks ago. It's by a guy called uh, Tony Coffey. From the name, you can probably see that he's a Ghanaian, but uh, his parents migrated from uh, Ghana to the UK before he was born. And he was born in the UK, 1966. And he has become one of the top jazz musicians in uh, Britain. You can see he has won so many awards. Uh, these are a few. I won't read them all, but you can see that he's well recognized. But this is his story. In 1982, this guy, when he was 16 years old, he was working on a construction site because his father wanted to train him to be a builder. But he fell three stories off of the building. There was part of the scaffolding that collapsed. And uh, he dropped three stories down onto his head. During that time, he was following. He was falling. He said, like, many things went through his mind. It was probably only a few seconds, but he said that it felt like it was maybe some days. And he, as he was falling, this is what he says. I saw many things. I saw my children that I hadn't even had yet. I saw future friends that I had never seen, but now they are my friends. But the thing that really stuck in his mind was he saw himself playing an instrument, a musical instrument. Now here he is as a builder, he has this experience where he, he gets to glimpse like into his future. He landed on his head and he lost consciousness. So he was in the hospital for a while. And uh, when he came to at the hospital after losing consciousness, he felt like he was a different person. And he did not want to return to his previous life at all. And over the following weeks, these images that he was seeing kept flashing in his mind. And he felt like he was being shown something and that the images represented his future. So when he got out of the hospital, the, the, the company that he was working with gave him some compensation money, uh, money for that injury. It wasn't much, he said, but with the money, he said he's going to use it all to buy this expensive instrument, which is a saxophone. And he used it to buy this thing that he had seen in his vision as he was falling. He told his parents that he wanted to do this, but his mother put her hand, her head in her hands and said, don't do it. Nobody makes a career from music. So she was just upset. Then the father told him that he has to get a proper job. And, but he himself asked his father to just give him a chance and he would prove that he could do it. And he began practicing. He said he started out five hours a day. Then he went up to 10 hours a day practicing, practicing, practicing. Now he's famous in the UK as one of the best uh, musicians. Now, I'm telling you this story because in each of you, there is a saxophone, there's a song for you to sing, there's a music for you to play. Tony was fortunate in that he, you know, he saw it, it almost cost him his life, but if you could see it, you would see that there are many good things that God has planned for you. 
Of course, we have to, most of us, we just have to fumble our way and figure it out. But if you keep doing the best you can with the opportunities that you have in front of you right now, this greater vision, this purpose, this mission that you were born to do will unfold of its own accord as you continue to set your intention to serve the greater good and to do the best with what you have been given. So never forget that there is something within you. You have a gift to share with the world. You must try and harness your potentials to your maximum to fulfill your mission. Yeah, so God bless you guys. Thanks for your kind attention and love to all of you. And back over to uh, Mr. Davis Gatete. All right, uh, thanks Uncle Tim. Uh, before you go, I'm just going to, I, uh, while you are speaking, I asked people to write their questions in the comment section. So I'm going to read, uh, I think, what time so that you respond. And then I read another two if you don't mind. Uh, so let's start with uh, let's start with uh, Maureen. Maureen Atim is our coordinator for Lira University, and she said, "I have always been haunted by that thought that I have to use my life to accomplish something beyond me. Sometimes it seems overwhelming that it even scares me off my course. I feel lost and start to worry if I will even ever manage." Uh, and you will answer that with this one from Edson from BSU who says, Uncle Tim, sometimes you understand yourself emotionally and you really find that some certain character in you is very difficult to change and it makes people feel bad. For example, being bold and open. How best can you let people understand you? Okay, let's, uh, let's tackle those two. Um... I would say, Maureen, that it's, it's actually good to have this feeling, uh, the feeling that you have to, you know, to use your life to accomplish something. That, that's coming from your soul. If you don't have that feeling, there's something dead in you. But if you have that feeling, it shows that there's, there's something that is crying for attention. Now, the problem when we are young is that we just can't see where the thing is going. And you get so many challenges and frustrations and you know you have these big dreams and things don't seem to be working out like on this call right now we have about 50 60 people i'm sure in this group uh you know maybe there's five of you your your dream is that you're going to become president of uganda but you know there's only one chair so what does that dream mean if you're having this dream and it doesn't work out and well you see, when you dream to become a president, symbolically, your soul is telling you that you are meant for bigger things. You may not end up as an actual president of a country, but you are meant to take up responsibility. You are meant to be a leader. You are meant to, to be somewhere. You get it. So you, you cultivate that dream. If, if you have this dream of being a president, you hold it and see as far as it can go, but, but understand it symbolically. Now, somebody else can have a, a dream that they're supposed to be a pilot. And you know, Uganda only has like three planes, so how can you get uh, 300 people and they're all dreaming to become a pilot? Well, if you have a dream to become a pilot, what that is saying symbolically is that you want to fly high in life. You want to go places. You don't want to be stuck in some village. You know, so you take it symbolically. Yeah, maybe you will become a pilot, but if not, you will go far. You will, you will fly high. That's the real essence behind it. So Maureen, just hang, hang on to it. Uh, all of us who are older, when we were your age, we were also fumbling in the dark and trying to figure things out. But if you focus on the step and you are faithful for the little thing that God has given you right now, then the next step will open, then the next one and the next one. And you see yourself climbing higher with time. But most of us are not like this guy, Kofi. We don't see that where things are going and we can get discouraged and we can make wrong decisions that have big consequences. So just Maureen, stay strong, be faithful in the small things and the other steps will come. You don't have to see the whole staircase. Just focus on the step that is right now in front of you and most of you, it means 
your education and, and the, the responsibilities uh, you have at this stage. So Edison says, sometimes you understand yourself emotionally and you find that some certain character in you is very difficult to change, although some people feel bad around you. Okay, so this is another good one, Edison, yeah. So part of emotional intelligence, you can see the first part is being self-aware. That's what you have. Edison, you have already developed a level of self-awareness just to think that way shows me that you are understanding yourself. But now, now the thing you have to do is to manage yourself. That's the second, you know, I gave you, there are four steps to emotional intelligence. The first is to understand yourself, but, but the second is to control yourself. Know your weaknesses and usually to get healthier in the personality type, you move in the opposite direction of your natural inclinations. So if you're too loud and too bold, you need to move toward being a little quieter, being a little more respectful and polite. You know, you can, some people say, no, that's just me, deal with it. Well, if you take that attitude, you're not going to have very many friends left. They will leave you. So all of us to a certain degree have to work on our weaknesses. If you're too shy, it means stepping up, being more bold. If you're too outgoing, it means dialing it back and, and uh, you know, keeping your mouth shut a little bit more. So that's part of growth. That is, you know, you, none of us is a finished product. We are a work in process. And if you want to have good relationships around you, if you don't want to hurt those around you, you have to modify your, your basic personality inclinations. All right. All right. Thanks, Uncle Tim. I'll read two more again. Uh, so Edgar Mpuga, through our HLD work, is providing leadership to our HYLF work in Chambogo. Began with a note and said, emotional intelligence is key to every person. Then he says, mistakes are inevitable, but only those with high level of emotional intelligence tend to have the right reactions. And he asks, how can we use our emotional intelligence to help develop positive success in all situations, especially when angry and when in tense situations among others. All right, so okay. yeah, let me just go with that one. Let me do these one at a time. So Edgar, um, yeah, each of us has uh, an area where um, we tend to let's say have a weakness in terms of emotion. You've mentioned anger there. Um, I personally, my, my personality gets angry when things aren't perfect. I'm a perf perfectionist. So now I've had to learn how to uh, control my anger. Now somebody else might have a problem with jealousy. Another person might have a problem with fear. Another person might have uh, a problem with lust. Like, there, there are some strong uh, energies or forces that are specific to different personality types. The more you understand yourself, the more you realize like that is my weakness. So when you're in a tense situation and you feel anger coming up, you just tell yourself, cool down, there you go again. If you get angry, you're going to cause uh, a lot of pain to people around you. So there's a certain, just a level of uh, self-awareness. The more awareness that you have, the more experiences that you have where you blew it and then you had to deal with the consequences, then it, it shows you how to modify. All right, then I'll just move on. Sasha Sanyu yes. says, uh, talks about living in harmony with some complicated workmates and people. Yeah, this is a good one because there's what, uh, what we call VDPs. You know what a VDP is? He's a very difficult person. <laughs> they are all around us. And all of us have a few VDPs in, in our life. And some people might be looking at us as if we are VDPs. But uh, she's talking about in a workplace or in, in your house, how do you deal with such people? Yeah, so I would say the only way you can is by undertaking some studies and personality types. 
when you study personality types, you get to know that this past personality type, it's normal for them to be that way. They don't see anything uh, weird about it. And then you start to develop an understanding that this personality type is like that because of certain things that maybe uh, push them into that direction. And then you get a bit of compassion and then you get a bit of patience. And there are some people that you can talk to very straight. Like if you have a, a tough guy or a tough woman personality like Miriam Matembe type, those people like you to come straight to their face and tell you. Another personality type is so sensitive, you can't just bust on them like that. But you see, this is where um, emotional intelligence requires you to study personality types. And then you get to, once you know someone's type, then you can moderate your response. So it's a long journey, Sasha Sanyu, but um, yeah, I'm happy to send you this book that is a study of nine basic personality types that I've used for the last 30 years. We use it in our organization. It's a guide for me personally, as I understand myself, I can see where I need to move in my own journey toward healthiness, but it also helps me put into context some of the VDPs, the difficult people that are around us, the complicated people. All right, back to you, uh, Nathan. All right, uh, Dalton says there are people that always withdraw when in an argument and feel guilty. What kind of personality is this? Okay, so yeah, the more sensitive you are, like I'm a fairly sensitive person, like I don't like criticism, I don't like conflict. So the more sensitive person, they will withdraw. Other people like, uh, you know, in AYLF, we have FISA. FISA is a tough personality. They actually like it when you conflict with them, when you are straight with them, because they think you are being honest and they think life is a, a bit of a boxing match and it's normal. But then other people are so sensitive. You say one word and for weeks, they are still, uh, you know, depressed about it. So um, in the Enneagram system, um, usually type four and type one. But see, I can tell you that, but you're going to have to study the system to, to unpack it. Um, again, uh, Tony, don't send me your email. I see Tony Rubriza. You guys send me uh, an email if you want the presentation. And you, if you want that book, you send it to the my own email, which I'm putting on the thing there. Then I will send it to you because this thing which is on the screen is going to disappear uh, soon. But if you send me an email, I'll send you this presentation. I'll send you a book. It's a lifelong study. I've been studying that thing for 30 years and I'm still learning every day, but it has helped me to be a, the leader I am. And you can see in Cornerstone and AYLF, we have diverse personalities. That's good because some leaders, they only want people who are like them and then they have all the same strengths and all the same weaknesses. But when you appreciate and study personalities, you will build a team that is diverse, just like a football team. You cannot have all midfielders or all, all goalies. I mean, they will just be uh, useless. They have to have this mix. And that gives you appreciation and, and compassion to deal with uh, people who are different than you. All right, back to you, Nathan. All right, uh, we have three more questions. Uncle Tim, do you have time to respond yeah, to ahead. those? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, Nimrod says, uh, uh, my question, Uncle, is what do you do to friends who think they are always right and whenever you try to correct them, they feel bad? All right, um, Nimrod, I think, you know, the, like all of us, there's, there's somewhere in the Bible that says, speak the truth with love. Speak the truth, but with love. So all of us, we have to work on that. Uh, I don't think it's good to keep quiet, especially in AYLF, in small groups. We give our friends permission to speak into our lives. That's rare. But in, a, in, a, in your small groups, you should be able to say to your friends, friends, if you see something in me that is not good, just tell me. You give them permission to speak into your lives. But when you have maybe others, like you're talking about uh, Nimrod, 
Yeah, you just have to try and continue to speak the truth, be gentle, and do it with love. Yeah, they might still feel bad, but later on, I can guarantee you, they will tell you you have you were a real friend. Other people were just, you know, speaking behind my back or something. They will come to appreciate you, but try and speak the truth with love. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh Fiona says sometimes sometimes you take time and evaluate yourself and become aware of your weaknesses and strength. But then you find that you keep doing things that you always want to get rid of. What can you do about that? Yeah, Fiona, I think all of us, um, we get into these habits um, and we get stuck. We just get stuck in the same conversations with our parents, for those of us who are married with our spouses, it's incredibly hard to break out of those stuck patterns. The only way you can do it is by just increasing your own emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence, and uh, looking at how you can move to a higher level. Because I don't think you want to be stuck. I think you want to I think you want to maximize your strengths and minimize your weaknesses. Again, uh, if you study your personality type and that book I talked about, the Enneagram, it shows you a roadmap. It gives you a roadmap on activities and things that you can do to move from the lower levels of your personality type to the higher levels of health and well-being. But it is a lifelong process. I would just say, don't give up, keep pushing on. Uh, it's not easy, but uh, you know we are we are here on Earth to to learn lessons and to grow. No one sends their kid to a a school and expects them to be in P3 for the rest of their lives. In the same way, God doesn't want you to be at P3 emotionally and spiritually the rest of your life. You are He wants to see you move to P4, to P5, to six and even to secondary and university. So just keep pushing forward. Uh, life is difficult. It has lessons, and those lessons are designed to provoke spiritual growth. Right. Uh, Akelo Mori, again, this, this one is similar to emotions, but I'll just read it if you have something else to say. Uncle some of us are overridden by our emotions. So please, how do we control our emotions, especially when it comes to relationships and people around us? Yeah, I would say that generally ladies, they're more emotionally sensitive. And then there are personality types that are very sensitive. And then, you know, to be frank, certain times of the month with ladies, their emotions are more on edge. So it is a challenge and uh, there's no easy way to do it, but I would just say that uh, again, write down that quotation that I gave you that emotions are meant to be indicators, not dictators. Emotions are good in a way. They are telling you there's something here to pay attention to. When you have an emotion, you ask yourself, why am I feeling this? Like it's an indicator, it's a teacher, it's a messenger, but it's not meant to be a master. So whenever, um, Maureen, when an when emotion comes to you, just say, this is a messenger, but it's not my master. I have the capacity to choose to focus uh, differently. I have the capacity to, to shift my emotions and find what works for you. Like sometimes what works for me is to listen to music. Uh, you know, there's a lot of emotion expressed in music. And when I'm in a particular emotional state that I don't like, I try and listen to music that takes me to another place that takes me to a healthier place. So work with different tools like that. Another thing I do is I like to take walks out into nature. Sometimes if, if you're uh, you know, on social media all the time, you just get yourself all stirred up by the, the, the Lugambo and the, you know, the talk going around and you just get yourself disorganized. So get out of it, switch it off, find something uh, that is completely disconnecting you from what is stressing you. All right. Uh, there's, still one, there's another one, Uncle Tim, if you don't mind. 
It is from yeah. Melissa. She says, is emotional, is emotional intelligence always pleasant? Are there times when the best reaction will be unpleasant to the other person because it's sounding like acting very polite and humble always to every person? No, not at all. I would say not at all. Emotional intelligence doesn't mean uh, just being polite and humble. It means being wise. So there are times you have to be straight and strong and tough. That's also emotional intelligence. You know in each circumstance what is appropriate. You get it. So there are people that, yeah, especially certain personalities, they like it when you are strong. So they don't want these meek, weak uh, people. They just walk on them, you know. So if you're emotionally intelligent, you know, like in this context, I need to be tough. In this context, I need to be gentle. So that's intelligence. It's the wisdom to know how to respond given the circumstances that are around you. All right. Uh, I, I'm going to try and make this the second last, otherwise we could go on and on till tomorrow. Arafat says, uh, how can one deal with a scenario where he inspires people around them, loving them, advising them, and the things work out, but personally things do not work out in their own favor. Uh, how best can a person heal from this? Okay, so Arafat, I think we all go through seasons when, when things are just rough and the things are Are not working out and we get discouraged and you keep doing the, the 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 next right thing like there are times when you can't see where life is going and you can't see where a relationship is going or you know the the, the circumstance is going but i can guarantee you if you continue to do the next right thing god will lead you out of that if you give up and you get depressed and you give it all up things will just get worse so when you're in a, such a situation, Arafat, just do the next right thing. Don't, uh, don't look back. Uh, just continue to put one foot in front of the other and you will heal. Talk to your friends, talk to mentors, uh, read inspirational literature. That's the only way that all of us have to try and uh, mitigate the challenges of being human in these bodies in difficult uh, circumstances and, and tough situations. So just keep working to try and uh, feed yourself with health. It's just the same way as if you are sick physically, what do you do? You start taking juice, you take abs, you eat well, you rest. Same thing emotionally. If you're emotionally messed up, feed yourself healthy food, feed, your, uh, feed yourself a healthy diet. Listen to inspiring things, not to depressing things. Take, uh, get good habits. Find friends that are uplifting. Find mentors that can advise you. But, uh, you know, it's just like emotional health also is similar to physical health. There are habits, there are techniques, there are things that you can do to help increase yourself, uh, your health. Let's keep going a little bit, Nathan. Uh, it's raining here, so... Uh, All right, perfect. Yeah. Perfect, because we had a couple of questions coming in. So Rose says, I have a problem with controlling my emotions. Again, when somebody hurts me, I don't fight. I keep it till I cry. After I cry is when I'm relieved. Any comments about that? Yeah, so a lot of ladies, um, you know, they, they get this buildup of emotions and they cry and it, it is released. I wish men, you could also learn that because... <laughs> Emotion, men want to keep it all inside. And when it, it, it is just kept inside, it can explode. And you, you know, or you, you just go downhill, you get depressed. But if you can just let it out, like crying is actually a release. And so you want to be sensitive. You don't want to be a wooden tree. If you are made out of a wooden tree, you're not a human being, you are, you are a piece of wood. So you want to be sensitive but you don't want to let emotions dominate you, get stuck in you, get stagnant in you. You want them to come, you feel them, you say, okay, I get the message, but now time for you to go. I don't want you to move into my house and you become a permanent resident. 
So the crying bit, especially for ladies, is like a release. And uh, it's fine to cry, Rose, and it's, it's actually a good way to just let it out. And uh, men, you can borrow a leaf sometime. You can cry silently, but don't die with those emotions inside you. Oh my God, you need to start crying more. Uh, Salim, Salim uh, Musa says, uh, how about a personality where people easily feel offended even when you're not addressing or talking about them? It's yeah. like you have a feeling of guilt. Yeah. Yeah, there are some people who are extremely sensitive and one small thing, they start to believe that you are against them and they, that you are, you know. So again, emotional intelligence says with this person, I have to be gentle. I have to be careful. But with this person, I just tell them straight to their face. They don't mind. So with time, um, with time, Haruna, uh, yeah, emotional intelligence does not use a one size fits all in relationships. You understand? There's nothing like a one size fits all. There's not one approach that works. The more intelligent you are, the more that you realize, okay, this person, they're extremely sensitive and I just have to be gentle with them. You can still speak what you want to say, but do it in a, a way that's gentle. A psychologist say that every time you say something negative to a person, you need to offset it with something like seven positives. So it takes seven positive to contract one negative, you know, so try to also compliment them. Uh, if you have an issue that you say, okay, I need to talk about this person's problem. Before you talk about their weakness, give several examples of their strength. Like you say, so-and-so, I love the way you do this. I admire you for this. I respect you for this, but over here, take a look at it. I think it needs attention. You see, so you, you counteract. That's all part of emotional intelligence learning how to uh, communicate, learning how to relate in a mature way, not using one size fits all, reading the other person's personality, adjusting the way you talk to them. Right, thank you. Uh, Irafasha Bruno asked, when can someone get to know and be ready to give up? Because at times giving up turns out to be a better option than holding on. Yeah, I think you need to, you need to try your best. Um, by the way, in, in the scriptures, in the teachings of Jesus, there was a formula he gave, like when you're having challenges with someone, he said, first go and talk to them straight. And if they accept, then you leave it at that. But if they don't accept, go and talk to them with a friend. And if they still don't accept, bring it to the, the group, the family, the, the small group, and you discuss it openly together. So there is a progression, but then Jesus said, if they still don't accept, you leave them be for a while. So I would say there is a time of walking away when you have tried everything, and then you need to just give it rest and maybe come back to it uh, later. All right, uh, then now, uh... Marcy Martin says, I have a problem with letting things go. It keeps hurting me over and over again. What do I do with this? Yeah, letting things go is another word for forgiveness. Um, forgiveness is a way of uh, just not holding on to things forever. And I think, you know, all of us have heard this expression that when we when we hold on to bitterness, it's like a poison that we just uh, would want to give to our enemy, but we keep drinking up it and we poison ourselves the more. So there's a, there's a lot of wisdom in forgiving, but sometimes deep wounds take longer to heal. So if you have been deeply wounded emotionally, don't expect it to go away overnight, give it time, do the things that uh, uh, help you to, to, to heal and uh, move on. But there is a point where, yeah, letting go and moving on uh, is necessary. Don't hold on to other things. I think with forgiveness, the main 
idea is to realize that that thing you are not letting go is hurting more you more than it is the other person. So just for your own sake, forgiveness doesn't mean that what they did was right. Forgiveness just means that I'm not going to let the wrong that happened continue to hurt me forever. So it's like self-respect, it's like self-love. You're saying, for my own sake, I'm just going to forgive and move on. Okay, Ashaba Pauline has an interesting one. She says she has a problem in conversation with someone where she reaches a point and she gets stuck of what to say next. I think this is true for all of us, right? I think all of us, you know, there are certain, certain people, you can talk forever, and there are certain people who can make conversation forever. And others of us are quiet. Like Pauline, I'm also a, relatively, I'm a quiet person. And, uh, you know, just realize that's how you are wired. Do the best you can. But uh, yeah, there are times when <laughs> there's not much more to do. But if you can think in that moment of something that they're interested in, for example, if it's a guy, you could start talking to them about football and who they think is going to win the, you know, the premiership. Like the book, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People has that point. It says, uh, throw questions to the other person based on what you think is their area of interest. So when you don't have words to say, throw a question to them that looks like something that they're interested in and just let them talk for a while. All right, uh, this is from Fairuz. Uh, Fairuz says, how do I learn to be a bit hard? I am hard, she means tough, because I'm a down to earth person and people just take advantage of that. I tried to be tough, but just end, end up, I just end up forgiving and ignoring. Okay, so, Fairuz, that's both a gift that you have, but too much of a good thing can become a bad thing. So it's good that you are down to earth and people are comfortable around you. But emotional intelligence says, I also have to be strong at times. And uh, I think there's always a place for forgiving. I think, uh, you know, we're told to forgive 70 times seven. Uh, but don't l ever let people take advantage of you. There's no place for that. When someone is taking advantage of you, you have the right to stand up and say no. Don't let people walk on you. Don't let people abuse you. That's when it's too much. So you have a good thing. You're down to earth. People are comfortable with you. That's your gift. But remember this, too much of a good thing becomes a bad thing. You can't just continue in the area where you are strong, you also have to compensate for your weakness. And your weakness is saying no and not letting people take advantage of you. And that's your area of growth. All of us have different directions of growth, but I would just say, Fairuz, be strong. And just now that you have seen that you are being taken advantage of, before the next time you are taken advantage of, say no, walk away from that uh, situation and never let yourself be abused. There's no place for that. Right, thanks. Uh, Lawrence or Tim says, I have a problem in controlling my emotions, but so I always decide to travel or take time, travel away or take time on social media in order to become released. Should I continue doing that? Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, Lawrence, like all of us have to figure out things that recharge our batteries. Uh, you know, find out, and they need to be healthy things because there are some things people can turn to. Like some people in the situation you are talking about, they turn to drinking. Now they're adding another problem onto the problem. So uh, if you want to travel or take time off the social media, if that's what you need to recharge your batteries, do it. Obviously, you have to do it in uh, balance because you can't just hide from people. But you know your limits. You know when it's getting too much and when you need to withdraw. 
And each personality type, again, is different here. Be realistic about who you are and what you need to cope with, with life. Other people can go through life bulldozing and they don't have to um, take time away because they are so tough. But those who are more sensitive, they need more time maybe to rest or to be alone or to read a book. For me, I like to walk in nature, you know, but find out what recharges your batteries in a healthy way and uh, use it as a way of, uh, of uh, releasing and controlling emotions. That's emotional intelligence. Right. Uh, I mean, Baba Ziroz uh, asked and said, everyone, she, a, she has a problem. Everyone around me fears me by my personality. In that even some of the kids are calling me on phone people say I'm a more complicated person. Okay. I do not yeah. know. So Rose, I don't see you here, uh, but uh, you are likely one of those very strong personality types. Um, I would get this book that I'm talking about, Enneagram, and look at type eight. Type eight is uh, the bulldozers of life, the, the, the people who are just meant uh, to plow through everything. They are very strong, but again, too much of a good thing becomes a what? A bad thing. And that's true with all of us. Nathan is a brilliant thinker, but if Nathan thinks and stays in his head all the time, it's going to become imbalanced. You get it? So all of us, we have our strength and that's what we bank on to get through life. But the problem is after a while, that strength becomes now a problem to us. And we have to move in the opposite direction. So Rose, uh, you know, you are, you're tough. If people are fearing you, uh, you are Enneagram 8. And what you have to do is to bring out the soft side of you, to bring out the compassionate side. I know it's there, but maybe life has forced you to become hard and tough. Now you're going to, if you want to be a leader, if you want to have uh, good relationships, now you have to apply emotional intelligence and move opposite to your strength. And for you, it means going to that softer, more feminine side, more gentle side. You just have to start to do it. There's no way out because if you continue the way you are, you will continue to turn off people and to alienate people. Uh, but if you cultivate the, you know, the gentle side of you and you always, before you open your mouth, you, you ask yourself, is this really going to hurt this person or not? And you speak in ways that is wise. Because a lot of emotional intelligence is just wisdom. Knowing how to modify yourself in order to have good relationships with others. I think I'm going to stop there um, and uh, I'll let you guys uh, wind it up. It's been good to be with you. And uh, yeah, just send me an email. I'll get you this information. These are actually things you'll be studying all your life. We never completely master them. Uh, so just realize you're on a journey, but there are tools that can help you with the journey. Again, uh, don't uh, send me your email because I'll be jumping off of here. Uh, Bruno is complaining that my Bambi, my uncle not answered my question. All right, Bruno. Bruno says, how do you deal with false accusations? How can I control myself when I'm not, I know I'm not wrong, but I'm being accused of the wrong that happens. Yeah, this happens to all of us. Huh? All of us, once in a while, we're accused and it's tough. You just have to, to swallow it. And uh, there's somewhere in the Bible that says, you know, if, if this happens to you, you just prove them wrong. Like if you bust out and get angry at them and overly defensive, you, they'll say, you see, we were right. But if you just humble yourself, be quiet, continue to do the right thing, later on they will say, Bambi, we were wrong. Bruno, we were sorry but you have to be able to just uh, show them 
by your actions. Whenever you're falsely accused, you have to show them that there's something different. You guys had it wrong. So just keep doing the right thing with grace, with humility. And eventually they will say, I think we were wrong about that guy, but it's not easy. It's painful. I've been there and I sympathize with you, Bruno. All right. Bye guys. I'm going to back out and I'll leave you to finish up here. All right. Uh, thanks, Uncle Tim. I was glad having you. Uh, guys, I'm sure you all enjoyed. Uh, this was a very excellent lesson. Uh, for the rest of the questions that you have, please discuss them in a small groups. I want to thank also our friends who joined us. I see many alumni, uh, uh, guys we work with. I see that uh, Edmond Burid, who, who works with us in the cartridge department for like, the high school. Uh, most of you, I, I'm sure, know him. Uh, you, uh, you, uh, if you have Edmond, you had, I want to give you a chance to speak a few words on the topic if you have any thoughts uh, uh, for the guys on the call. I should unmute and, uh, and a few, one share a few words. I also see Paul is on. Paul, thanks for joining us. The younger Paul, the work colleague. Uh, Edmond, if you are on the call, please unmute and say a few words. And then Adam will also say hello to us. Uh, then we'll hand over to Katita to give the last announcements before we go. So, Edmond, can you just unmute, say hello, and make a few comments? Any? Hello. 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 Oh. Here you. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, Paul. Paul. Okay. Paul. Then Edmond. Yes, Paul. Here you. Yeah, I'm really glad to be here, and thanks to AYLF for organizing this program. Uh, I've already seen it shared by Gatete that they would be having. Uh, a platform of sharing this and I've always wanted to be part until I saw it on his status and I was already late by around 30 minutes but I'm glad I'm glad I caught up and one of the key takeaways for me was that uh, emotions are meant to be indicators and not dictators so you guys well done for making it here and hope to be part of more platforms like this thank you very much for organizing thanks Paul Thanks for joining us, Paul. Uh, over to you, Edmond. Okay, uh, thank you, Nathan and uh, Gatete for, for providing leadership to the group, but also for today's session. Uh, I should say that I, I'm, I was glad to be part of it. It's, uh, it's one of those sessions in which there's always something to learn. And uh, for me, I decided to join this session today for two main reasons. One, was that it's it it had been long since I I I, I heard from or saw some of our members, especially our HLD guys. I see Patrick Okello here and many other people. And uh, also to emphasize that HLD and AYLF are really one thing. And uh, I hope forward to have more of our former HLD guys join in, even when they are not in small groups, but just to be along and uh, learn and hear from the rest of the colleagues. Otherwise, I I thank you again for organizing today's session and Gatete for the link. I almost missed, but thank you. Uh, God bless you all. Stay safe. COVID is real, but we will overcome. All right. Uh, thanks, Edmund, for those words. I will also ask Fanny Alan to say hello to us. Alan. And okay, then, Nathan, thanks. Yes. Uh, it's, good, it's good to pass by. <laughs> <laughs> I've been up to many other things, but it's good to pass by. And uh, I was here enjoying the conversations, great questions from the guys, uh, which showed a lot of uh, uh, people being attentive to the conversation, but also for the effort they made to hang around. Thank you also, Nathan and Gateti and Pfizer for just making sure we have this community call going, uh, just to make sure that we, we keep in the together. And to you all guys, thank you for coming today. I hope we can catch each other in other ways uh, during this lockdown. 
Uh, I don't have so much to say. I just enjoy the conversations. Yeah, thank you. Nathan, you are muted. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, I was saying before I hand over to you, but I want to thank the guys for, for coming, especially those who shared the link with the, with the members of the groups and the shoulder. Uh, let's do that the next time. Uh, when next week in your small groups, uh, please extend this conversation. That's the plan, really. I'm sure by then that it will have forwarded to you the, the slides that were used. For those of you who will not have gotten it personally, read through, understand, and they send this conversation so that you can help somebody out there. Yes, and then uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is that there are some of us who struggle with going on and off the call. So I'm just going to give you a tip. Uh, and if you're going to join a meeting, make sure you are not on the, on the move because you always jump off and off on. But also, secondly, uh, do go simple speed test on your phone, whatever you use to join. Just type Google speed test then find a spot in your house, in your room, in your home, which has the best uh, speeds, especially here with the download speeds. You'll see upload and download speeds. See that spot with the best speed and sit there. You'll most likely stay on the call without having to drop on and off. Personal and Gatita did the recording. So please share a link with your members so that whoever was dropping on and off can have a chance to, to send through the whole of it maybe a second time. Otherwise, that's all for me. I'll hand over to the head. Give us a few announcements. We have an upcoming newsletter and a few other things. I'll let him give you some of his notices. Yeah, but thanks for coming and bye from me. Thank you, Nathan. And thank you, everyone, for attending. I am very sure we've learned something. Even if you, you are on and off, at least you came in the middle when he was uh, saying something. Okay, so uh, we are all aware that we are supposed to extend this conversation to our small group discussions. And uh, I'm glad that some small groups are happening tomorrow. So this conversation goes on till next week on Thursday until Friday when we have another conversation. Oh yeah, no. So Friday will not have this call. We'll have our usual coordinators meeting on Saturday, okay? So keep this conversation until next week on Friday, and then we'll have the coordinators meeting on Saturday. Uh, as Nathan said, we, we, we have our newsletter coming up. I just want to, to, to show you something small so you get the details when it is out. I, um, 